so delighted to see you all here. I'm Mark Russo, Dean of Libraries, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jerry Rushford, who is director of the Jerry Rushford Center for Research on Churches of Christ and the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement that is located here in Payson Library, right outside these doors and down the hall. Dr. Rushford's tireless energy and vast knowledge have deeply influenced faculty, staff, and students at Pepperdine for many decades. In fact, he just celebrated his 40th anniversary with Pepperdine this year. Congratulations. Thank you. Over his long and distinguished career here at the university, Dr. Rushford has served in a variety of capacities as minister for the University Church of Christ, as director for the Rushford, uh, for the Church Relations Office, and as professor of religion at Seaver College, and now, of course, as director of the Rushford Center. He has also directed the Pepperdine Bible <coughs> Lectures for 30 years, an amazing accomplishment. We're delighted to have Dr. Rushford with us this afternoon. We know he's a busy man, and we're, we're grateful that he's taken time away from his schedule to share time with us and to share his insights on a most fascinating friendship and rivalry. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our friend and dear colleague, Dr. Jerry Rushford to the podium. Thank you, Mark. I'll let you sit right here. Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everyone. For the past two years, I have been fascinated by the public discourse, and we have been inundated in both print and media, reminding us that it's a terrible time. We have lost all civility. Families have been divided. Old friends will not speak to each other anymore. Um, it gets worse week by week, a country filled with anger, filled with division, and that's all true. It's a tough time. I used the word acrid when I was describing it on your convo credit. It really, a, it is a terrible time for civil discourse. I have no difficulty with agreeing to that, but I began to notice that I was disagreeing when the suggestion started to be made that this was unprecedented, that we had never had an election like we had in 2016, that we had never had the fallout that we've had in the last two years, that we had never had the terrible jokes and the beheadings and the death threats and everything that goes with it like the last two years. And as a historian, that's where I part company. So I begin by saying one of our own faculty members, Ed Larson, who I think Ed still lives on this campus, wrote a book about the first presidential election, not George Washington. He was unopposed. Everybody was willing for George to be our founding father. And he set the pace by serving two four-year terms. He could have stayed in office and said the presidency is till you die. He wisely said two four-year terms, that's enough. And then his vice president moved in. John Adams had four years and thought he had four more. And then the Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, decided he would run opposite Adams. And the result, Ed's book is called, and this is right off the shelf here in uh, Payson, a mag magnificent catastrophe. It was magnificent, the first campaign in American history, and it was a catastrophe. The tumultuous election of 1800, America's first presidential campaign, there was backstabbing like you wouldn't believe, there were backroom deals, people who had, had farms adjoining each other wouldn't talk to each other, Jefferson wrote, I was reading it in Meacham's book just this week, Jefferson wrote, I can walk down the street now and people who have known me and been my friends from years will cross over to the other side of the street. 
and they'll divert their eyes. They don't want to look up at me because they don't want to give me that tip of the hat that is part of just being kind to take your hat and tip it to somebody you know. They don't want to do that. And here is, here is this election of 1800 that causes so much more strife and anger and fallout than probably we've experienced in the last two years. Um, or, if you want to really talk about division, we thought that the um, Gore-Bush election of 2000, you know, that was awful. It took two months to decide, all of November and December. It was some time before finally Bush was announced that he would be the president. And we had this same conversation. This is unprecedented. We are so ugly anymore, the way we deal with each other. It's unprecedented, but it wasn't. And one person who knew it was Roy Morris. And he sat down and came out with this book in 2003, Fraud of the Century. Rutherford B. Hayes, Samuel Tilden, and the Stolen Election of 1876. He didn't realize when he wrote this that the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court was also writing a book on this topic. He had played a key role in Bush versus Gore. And so he was writing his book, which came out the very next year, and he called it The Centennial Crisis. Think of this. July 4th, 1876, everybody goes to Philadelphia to celebrate 100 years. We are the best nation in the world. We're the United States of America, and we have survived for 100 years. And we go to Philadelphia, and we relive the beginnings, and we reread the Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution, and we see the Liberty Bell. Aren't we great? And then comes the election in November. And how long did it take to decide that? In those days, the president took office on the first Friday in March. They announced two days before March 4th who the, who the winner was. It took all of November, December, January, February. Well, surely the winner is Samuel Tilden. You all know Samuel Tilden, the governor of New York. He won by over a quarter million votes. Of course he's the next president. Only he's not. And um, this was the disputed election of 1876, which affects the friendship of this talk, because Jeremiah Sullivan Black became the lawyer representing Tilden, and Garfield was in the committee of 15, the electoral committee, that ended up voting 8 to 7, 8 to 7, 8 to 7, because they had 8 Republicans and 7 Democrats. It was the stolen election. What did this do to the friendship of Black and Garfield, who did dearly love and admire each other. So here we go. It's the story of Jeremiah Sullivan Black and James Garfield, but there's a third person involved. And that was their commitment to an American religious reformer named Alexander Campbell. They became followers of Campbell. And when they met each other in Washington, DC, they went to church with other followers of Campbell who called their churches either Church of Christ or Christian Church. But Campbell was a restorationist, a back to the Bible, wanting to restore New Testament Christianity. The um, great church historian, Edwin Gaustad, wrote a book about 20 years ago, Sworn on the Altar of God, a religious biography of Thomas Jefferson. How could you write a, a religious biography of Jefferson? He really didn't think much of the Christianity that he was surrounded with. He didn't go to church much. But four years before he died, he writes a letter to a friend, and uh, he says to him that what would really attract him would be Christianity that emphasizes the purest form from the beginnings of the teachings of Jesus. He would be interested in a path to reform, a theology that would take us back to the beginning. He said that he would... would he would champion the pure and the primitive gospel. Where is he getting this from in 1822? He goes further and he uses the word happy. This is Thomas Jefferson. Happy is the prospect of a restoration of primitive Christianity. 
Where is that from? Even before I read the next line or two, I thought, he's, a, he's aware of Alexander Campbell. They're both Virginians. We have the book by the PhD from Harvard, Alexander Campbell and Thomas Jefferson, a comparative study of two old Virginians. And then I got to the next line, and this great historian says, um, this language sounds remarkably like that of Alexander Campbell, who in the last two decades of Jefferson's life preached on the Virginia frontier a message of restoring the primitive church, going back to the Bible, back to the words of Jesus. Jefferson. And then about uh, six years, three years after Jefferson dies, they're rewriting the Virginia Constitutional Convention. The, the Constitution has to be rewritten. And Campbell gets elected from Brook County, and he goes to Richmond early October and stays three and a half months with 94 delegates, and they're going to hammer out a new, a, a new Constitution. And there's James Madison, former president of the United States. There's James Monroe, former president of the United States. There's John Tyler, future president of the United States. And uh, there's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall. They're all there. And... Um, Campbell comes to town. There's not a Church of Christ. It started in 1832 in Richmond. But Campbell is so well known, he preaches one Sunday for the Presbyterians, the next Sunday for the Methodists, the next Sunday for the Baptists. He's preaching for three and a half months, and all of the delegates are going to hear him, including the great uh, John, uh, James Madison. And so when Madison was asked about Campbell, at that convention, he said, oh, he gave the great speech against slavery, and John Randolph took him to task for it. The slaveholders won then, but that was a terrible victory for them. But then, Madison says, but it is as a theologian that Mr. Campbell must be known. It was my pleasure to hear him very often as a preacher of the gospel, and I regard him as the ablest and most original expounder of the scriptures I have ever heard. And Campbell was original. And I give that quote just to say this. This is what draws Black and Garfield to Campbell and ultimately what draws them together. So you go through Pennsylvania and there's signs everywhere about Black. You know, he was born here, he died here. Uh, he served at York and so on. And uh, here he is at the beginning. He's born in 1810. I, when I showed you the three pictures, they're all 21 years apart. Campbell was born in 1788. 21 years later, Black is born. 21 years later, Garfield is born. It's three generations. And here's Black, who's going to study law under Chauncey Forward. And then he's going to marry Chauncey Forward's daughter when she's only 16 and a half. And he, he's, uh, by the time he's 33, he is a famous lawyer. And, but he, he wants to know more about the Bible. And he's heard about Campbell. And he's thinking... I will write to Campbell and ask if I can come and visit him. So on the far right of your map is Somerset, Pennsylvania, where Black is living. And this is not the route he would have taken. This is if you're driving it today in three hours, all the way to the end over here on the left, which is Bethany today, West Virginia. But it was Virginia when he was sitting with Madison in that convention. It's just barely inside the Pennsylvania state line. You can drive it in three hours, but how long would it have taken them in their horse and buggy? He and his wife, their seven-month-old son, uh, the nurse, and a widow who went with them. And they come over to study under Campbell. This is what he looked like at that time in 1843 with some of his children. And here comes Black to study the Bible for a week or more. And here's the Campbell mansion in Bethany. And... Um, on the left there is Strangers Hall, the far left. That's where all the visitors stayed. And that's where they stayed for that week. Uh, I was there two years ago. I've you know, toured this home many a time. Behind the house is Buffalo Creek. And then it runs over here. And then it comes across the road down to the left. Now, out in the yard is... Um, oops, it went the wrong way. Out in the yard is um, Campbell's octagonal study... I don't know, it's about 60 feet from the house. And that's where he writes his books, and that's where he studies uh, with Black. 
but it ends up here at the house. And on the last day, Black says to him, you've convinced me I want to become a Christian. I just want to be a Christian only. What Black really loves is the passage in Acts 11 where it says the followers of Jesus were first called Christians at Antioch. And for the rest of his life, Black, when people would say to him, where do you go to church? What church are you a member of? Jeremiah Sullivan Black said, I'm with that group that were first called Christians in Antioch in Acts 11. That's my group. Those are my forebears. What an interesting answer. They leave the house. They go to Buffalo Creek. Alexander Campbell immerses him into Christ. And... Um, and Black heads home. He has studied with Campbell in his octagonal. Here's the actual photograph of Campbell inside that study. Now Black goes home, and within eight years, in 1851, and now he's 41 years old, he's not only on the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, he's the Chief Justice. He is really moving up. Meanwhile, he sends his, um, his boy, Chauncey, back to Hiram College in northeastern Ohio, and that's where young James Garfield is going to school. Garfield was attracted to Campbell, and he had been baptized, not by Campbell, but in, when he was 18 in 1850, and he enrolled here at Hiram, and he meets Chauncey Black. The only reason I'm telling you is one day Chauncey Black will introduce him to his father. I think Chauncey Black got kicked out of the school, as I recall, but he and Garfield remained good friends. And they met Campbell. Garfield went over to meet Campbell in, in uh, Bethany. And he sits on a hill looking at Campbell working down there in that octagonal study. And he writes in his diary, just think, at the stroke of his pen, he has heard over half the civilized world. Which was pretty true. A lot of followers in Australia, a lot of followers in the United Kingdom, on the continent. Campbell was writing to a wide diversity of people. And what's Black doing? Well, he's corresponding with Campbell. Look at this one. Bethany, Virginia, June 18, 1855. Campbell writes to the young man that he baptized on June 18, 1855, Brother Black, my dear sir. And he thanks him for some favor. Now, six more years go by, and James Buchanan has just been elected 15th president of the United States, and he is announcing his cabinet, and he stuns Jeremiah Sullivan Black. I don't think he told him this in advance. He says the attorney general for the United States will be the chief justice of the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania, Jeremiah Sullivan Black, and I am summoning him here to Washington, D.C. I don't think Black had any idea that was coming. Now in, 18, in March of 1857, he's moving. There's Black on the far right, and there's Buchanan, the president, standing in the middle, and there's his cabinet. Now Garfield, after, when the war is declared, goes to war. He's been told that um, it's going to be a great anti-slavery campaign. He's for that. He's from the North. He wanted to go to college under Campbell, but Bethany College was in Virginia, and that was the South. And he went down, and he looked it over, but he said, I just can't do it. And he went to school at Williams College up in Massachusetts. And, uh, but now he has great success in the war, and after his ride at Chickamauga, Lincoln makes him major general. But Lincoln says, while you've been fighting, your friends back home have elected you to the 32nd Congress. I'm making you major general, but now I'm ordering you to come home and take your seat in the 32nd Congress, because I have a greater need for a safe Republican vote in the 32nd Congress than I do of another general kicking around in Georgia. You come on home. So Garfield comes home in his uniform, and Chauncey Black introduces him to his father. And uh, here's Jeremiah Sullivan Black. He's at the you know, peak of his powers. Garfield shows up. Garfield actually goes into the Congress the first day, only the first day, wearing his uniform with all of his major general buttons on it or something, just to remind everybody of who he was. He was 32 years old, major general. He's starting his career in Congress. Now later, Briggins, of all the books uh, on uh, Black, I think this one's the best. It's just called Jeremiah Sullivan Black. It was a PhD dissertation. It's published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 1934. But this is what he says. Thereupon began one of the most unique of friendships among public men. Black was 21 years the elder. He was an intense and radical Democrat, 
Garfield was a thorough Republican. Upon the surface, the only common tie between them was the fact that both were members of the same church, the followers of Alexander Campbell going to church there in Washington, D.C. Then, as they're talking, Black says to him one day, do you know the case of Milligan? What do you think? And, Mill and Garfield says, I'm on Milligan's side. I don't think civilians should be tried in front of military tribunals the way Milligan was. Three of them were tried in 1864. The war was still going on. They lived in Indiana, which was in the north. But they were speaking in favor of the South. They were giving comfort to the South. They were accused of rebellion. They were accused of causing all, and they were suffered to hang. They were, the verdict came down, you were to die. You don't live in Indiana and give comfort to these Confederates. And Garfield, who was a thorough anti-slavery man from the North, he didn't agree with that. There were civil courts that could have tried their case. Black said, I've decided to help Milligan and we're gonna take this to the Supreme Court. Would you help me? And so Garfield goes home and reads up on it, and he said, yes, I believe this. And Black says to him, this will hurt you in your career. This will hurt you with the Republicans. They will never forgive you for this. And Garfield says, no, this is right. I believe this. So they go before this court, Salmon Chase. There he is sitting in the middle. Here are the nine members of the Supreme Court Black says to Garfield, how long have you been you know, a member of the bar? Six years. How many cases have you tried? None, I've never been in a courtroom. Yeah, I went to law school. I got my training over there in Cleveland and he said, well, we're going before the Supreme Court. Are you ready? And he said, I'm not sure. The Supreme Court for my first case. And then Black says, I've laid out a strategy. I think you ought to go first. <laughs> so it's in the book that Hinsdale put out on the great speeches of Garfield. It's in our library. And Gar Garfield speaks for two hours before the Supreme Court. He's never spoken in any court. And he flaps his wings with a two-hour tour de force. And he and Black win that case. Um, you know, here, here's my copy. The Milligan case. This is over 500 pages. I see that I have paid... I paid $50 for this one, but it's worth this 1929 book. I don't know where I found it. But all the speeches are there, and uh, this is really cementing the friendship now. The Milliken case, 1921, that's my book. And then Alexander Campbell dies, and his will is challenged. And his widow says to Black and Garfield, will the two of you come and defend the will of my Late husband. Well, of course, they love Alexander Campbell. So in 1868, they're working together again, only two years after Milligan. They're working together, and they win that case, and they you know, defend the will of Campbell. Now, Garfield's a member of Congress, and he's made chairman of the Military Affairs of the House of Representatives, 1867 to 69. He's the chairman. That's him in the middle with his beard. And they're going to church at a poor little building, which later, when Garfield becomes president of the United States, and he's still going to this church building, the press made fun of this building and called it the Campbellite shanty, using a slang slur for Alexander Campbell. These followers of Campbell are Campbellites, and this is their shanty they call a church building. And it was pretty unattractive. When Garfield was president, the man who would drive him in the horse and buggy to this church would say to him, after I let you and your wife and your mother off, can I go park over there in front of the Episcopal church? It's much nicer. And, and the other drivers make fun of me when I'm over here in front of this. And Garfield said, yes, yes, you can do it, but you cannot be late picking us up. The president of, the church, of, of America cannot be standing around on a corner waiting for his ride to come pick him up. So here's where they went to church, the old Vermont Avenue Christian Church. And it needed a preacher, and they worked together to go get H.T. Anderson. Henry Tompkins Anderson had produced an amazing translation of the Bible. The Anderson Bible came out in 1864. He's a brilliant scholar. How did they get him a job? He needed money. They went to U.S. Grant, the president. 
And they said, we need a job so we can bring this man to Washington and be our preacher. And Grant gave him a job in his administration. So now Anderson comes. So the friendship between, it's growing and it's getting stronger. And um, Garfield writes things like this in his diary. I spent a delightful evening and night with the judge in his new house. This would be in York, Pennsylvania. He is a glorious man, full of ideas, full of power. Their, their friendship is really growing here in 18... I didn't mention, they did a case in 1870. I'm going to show his picture. They defended the Phillips brothers and the, of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and they won that case. The Phillips brothers were in petroleum, and they loved both Black and Garfield, but they were Republicans like Garfield. And uh, do we have any connection with the Phillips at Pepperdine? Probably not. But that T.W. Phillips, who they won that case for, his children and grandchildren gave us the money to build a 125-foot theme tower at the entrance to our campus with a cross in it. So the Phillips theme tower out there, which I can see from my plane, you know, when I'm flying back from San Francisco, you look down from your flight, you can see the Pepperdine campus. That slender white needle is shooting up. It just, you can spot it from many, many miles away. That's the Phillips Tower. They won that case in 1870. But look at what, well, look at what Garfield is writing. Things like this. I never meet Judge Black without feeling what power and culture and genius of mind have done to overcome all the roughness of partisan feeling. In other words, we argue a lot. Overcome the roughness of partisan feeling and made a man a great and delightful friend. At the end of that year when they hadn't seen each other for several months, I caught this in Garfield's diary. For many months, I have been hungry for the sight of you. Well, that's going to change in three years with the disputed election. That is worse than anything we've experienced in the last two years. And now they're going to church, and they're worshiping together, and they're singing together, and they're celebrating Holy Communion together, and they're breaking bread together. I often wonder what that was like after 1876. Hello, Brother Garfield. Hello, Brother Black. As they pass and they have nothing to say as the anger is building up over the stolen election. But here in 73, I am hungry for the sight of you. Who was bothered by this? Garfield's best friend, Burke Hinsdale. Who, write, who puts together the big two-volume set there in our library of the works of Garfield? Burke Hinsdale. Who succeeds Garfield as president of Hiram College when he goes off to fight in the war? Burke Hinsdale. Who was the only strong member of the Church of Christ that Garfield was going to give a position to in his government because he didn't want to be accused of being a, a, have favorites? But, it, but Hinsdale wanted to go to Europe so bad. Just, I don't care. I'll go to Norway, any country. I would just love to be the ambassador in Europe. And Garfield couldn't pull it off because he had so many people to thank. But he finally said, I've made you ambassador to the Sandwich Islands. The Sandwich Islands. You and I know them better as Hawaii. That's not a bad gig, Hawaii. To be, you're going to go represent America in Hawaii. But of course, Garfield was gunned down before that, and Hinsdale never went. But Hinsdale doesn't like black. As black as he doesn't like a lot of Democrats. And so he writes to Garfield. This is Burke Hinsdale, Garfield's closest friends. I brought a book here today. The, uh, here's, here's the letters of, of Garfield and Hinsdale. You know, 550 pages of correspondence. This is in our library as well. So here's Hinsdale. And Hinsdale writes... I read Judge Black's article on Adams and Seward, but at the end of that article, this is New Year's Day, 1874, at the end of that article, I found myself asking, as I always do after reading one of Black's articles, how did it happen that those Southern fellows were always in the right? He doesn't like Black, because he doesn't like slavery, he doesn't like the South. This is Hinsdale writing to Garfield. But Garfield pacifies him. No, no, Black's my friend. And then they meet to uh, 
Black does the eulogy when they uh, do the bust of Campbell at, you know, at, at Bethany College and so on. And here's T.W. Phillips, whose family built our theme tower out here in the front of the campus. And they win that case for him. So here's Black and here's Garfield, these two great giants. And they're meeting in each other's homes. This is Garfield's home, a sketch in Washington, D.C., which they moved into in 1869. If you read descriptions of people who went there to have dinner, they always talk about books, 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 books everywhere. There are even books in the toilet. There's just books everywhere when you go to... Garfield was the first president of the United States to be on the board of the Smithsonian Institution. I mean, he just, he was a scholarly man. And, uh, and Black was a scholarly man. I wish I had a photo of Black's house called Brocky. It's the one image I couldn't find today. But here's the house, uh, and I'll tell you some sad news. Is that house still standing? No, of course not. It was torn down in 1964 for what? What would have been more important? For a parking lot. You gotta be kidding me. Everybody in Washington, D.C. went to this house. Garfield lived there until he moved into the White House. Every political figure came by. Everybody ate there. And we tear that down for a parking lot. Here's the house Garfield moved into in Minter, Ohio in 1876. Black was there a lot. So here they are staying all night. One night, Garfield was on a train that got the, it got decoupled somehow, and all of his bags went in another direction. Then the train he was on stalled, and he was in his nightwear. He was, he was in bed clothing. He came out to find out, you have no suitcases, so get over it. Your pajamas are it. He said, what town are we in? They said, um, this is York, Pennsylvania. He walks through the entire town of York in his pajamas, climbs the hill up to Jeremiah Sullivan's Black. What a, what a shock Black must have had. He knocks on the door, and Black opens the door. See Garfield in his pajamas, and he said, well, it's a long story, Judge. The plane, the train I'm on is not working, and my suitcases are on their way to Baltimore. And uh, do you have some clothes I can borrow? So he says, I left the house in one of the judge's best shirts. And he describes the collar and, and all this. They were just great friends. And then came this election. And here it is. This is when it falls apart. Samuel Tilden, great man. He took on, you know, Boss Tweed. He took on all the corruption in New York and beat them at their own game. Tilden was an honest man. He's a good governor of New York. The Democrats made a good choice. We're going with Tilden. The Republicans went through all kinds of arguments. They couldn't decide on, you know, U.S. Black wanted to serve a third, I mean, uh, U.S. Grant wanted a third term. You can't serve another four years. George Washington only served eight. Jefferson, eight. Madison, eight. You can't, you can't go 12 wouldn't be American. Is there a law against it? No, there isn't, but you can't do that. So reluctantly, Grant goes around the world in a tour, you know, and so they're, now they're fighting who's going to be the next candidate, and they end up with a pretty weak choice in the governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes. He's not a, a great anything. He was a general in the Civil War, but he's not a great speaker. He's not known for anything. So Tilden's probably going to win this election, and he does by over 254,000 votes. Uh, only he doesn't. Ah, here's a photo, Melissa, I dug out of the old archives of Howard White, the fifth president of the United States and the inspiration for the hawk on our campus, the HAWC, the Howard A. White Center. Here's Howard White, the great historian, teaching on the LA campus in the 1960s. And what is he teaching on that day in his history class? Well, you don't have to look very long to know what this lecture was about. It's the stolen election of 1876. And behind him it says 184. And you can see the first three letters. Um, T-E, yeah, Tilden. Tilden had 184. How many electoral votes do you have to win the presidency? 185. Tell me how many you have again. 184. Ooh, poor you. Well, but my opponent, Hayes, only has 166. And the other 18 are disputed. 
uh, or 19, let's see. Yeah, to get to 185, 19 are disputed. Actually, 20 were disputed. Uh, there was one disputed in Oregon, but the Republicans went over and got that one back. But then there was Louisiana. They hadn't turned theirs in yet, and that was eight electoral votes. And Florida had four, and South Carolina had seven. All of them had botched their election. To start with, they weren't letting the free blacks vote. And that was against, you know, they, they had a right to blow, vote. I mean, the males did. And uh, th there were things that were wrong with each of those elections. And they couldn't decide which way to give those states to. And they couldn't decide in November, December. Finally, in January, they put together a, an electoral commission of 15 people. Who controlled the House? The Democrats. So they had three Democrats, two Republicans. One was Garfield. Who controlled the Senate? The Republicans. So they had three Republicans, two Democrats. So now we're at five to five. The other five had to go to members of the Supreme Court. First two that were picked were Democrats. Next two that picked were Republicans. Well, so now we're down to eight. You know, we're down to seven and seven. Who's going to be the 15th person? There was only one member of the Supreme Court that was an independent. They said, it's got to be you. And he knew he would be crucified. Whichever way he decided, he said, I don't want this appointment. And they said, no, you don't get a choice. We got to have, no, he said, I'm serious. I am not going to be the deciding vote. So they had to give it to somebody else, and he turned out to be a Republican. So how did the vote go? Eight to seven, all the way through. All the way through, Jack. Garfield went down to Louisiana. Oh, was that ugly down there. How'd they vote? Eight to seven. All eight Louisiana votes go to Hayes. Then they went over to South Carolina. Now, that one really was a mess. Those seven should have gone to Hayes, and quickly they did. And then Florida had four, and they went there, and those all went. So in the end, Hayes wins the Electoral College by 185 to 184, and Black is outraged. I mean, uh, here are the great speeches of Black. This is put together by his son. And one of the speeches is called Open Letter to Garfield. Oh, I'll bet that's a sweet letter. Open Letter to Garfield. And it goes 21 pages. And it's small type. This is a long letter, and it went to everybody in the country. And it opens with Open Letter to General Garfield, to Honorable James A. Garfield, member of Congress from Ohio. I have read the speech you sent me. I am astonished and shocked as the leader of your party to whom the candidates have splendidly delegated the conduct of the campaign. You should, not, you should have met your responsibilities in a very different way. And on he goes. Uh, it, it is just vitriolic. And you get to the end. And... Now he says to Garfield, um, these friends of yours, they have blinded your judgment. They have made your conscience inaccessible. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your church. You owe it to your country to break off at once from the political associates who are capable of such indefensible conduct. They have seared your conscience. You are inaccessible to the principles, wait for it, to the principles, you are inaccessible to the principles planted in Jews in Jerusalem by the what? The people who were first called Christians at Antioch. That's his church. And now he's saying to Black, that's our movement. The Christians who, who were the people who were first called Christians at Antioch, that's us. And, uh, and then he ends, his very last line, it doesn't even end. I mean, there's not a lovely ending. He says, what makes this worse is your closing declaration that you will take no step backward. There is to be no repentance, no change of policy, and consequently, no peaceful or honest government. Onward, you say, is the word. Onward to what? To more war, more plunder, more oppression, more universal bankruptcy, heavier taxes, and still worse frauds on the public treasury? Question mark. End of article. <laughs> 21 pages. Really hard stuff. And, um, and Garfield knows we're not going to be speaking together much. And 
So Morrison writes the book and Rehnquist writes the book. And uh, Black says to, oh, let me go back. Four years go by in which they're, they're not speaking together much at church. They own property together. They had a farm together. They try cases together, but not after 1876. They see each other at church, but this great friendship has re is really on the rocks. But they're being civil, but it's... And then Black goes on vacation. He owed it to himself. He had never been to London. You've got to go to London. And he goes to London in the summer of 1880, and he just knows that U.S. Grant's going to be chosen again by those dirty Republicans. He's come back from his world tour. He still wants to get in four more years. Or they'll give it to Blaine or that worthless John Sherman in Ohio. But he gets a telegram that the Republicans on the 36th ballot could never decide who they wanted. Grant couldn't get it. Nobody could get it. They have chosen an unknown representative from Ohio named James Garfield who's only 49 years old, on the 36th ballot. And Black is reading this in London. And uh, he's torn. Is he happy for his friend? Would he campaign for him? Oh, get real here. <laughs> no, he's not going to campaign for him. He's going to campaign for Hancock, the Democrat. But he writes to Garfield on June 9. I suppose I ought to be glad for two reasons, at least. In the first place, it opens the way by which my very dear friend will probably reach that great office which makes ambition virtue. You're probably going to be president. And secondly, I should rejoice because it saves the country from the calamity of Grant or Sherman. And then he writes a little more in the same letter. I'm sure that if elected, you will try your best to do justice to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. Where is that from? Micah 6, 8. So he, he takes a scripture and he throws it back in Garfield's face. You will do your best to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. But to a certain extent, you're bound to fail. For in our country, the leader of a party is like the head of a snake. It can only go as the tail impels it. And your tail will be a very perverse one that Republican Party. Then the Philadelphia Times gets a hold of Black, and they said, we're a Republican paper, we're all for Garfield, and we know you're probably not happy, but we will print anything you send us. And he says, I have been his devoted friend for many years, and I am resolved that I never will believe that he does not deserve the affection I have bestowed upon him. If he would carry the principles which regulate his private life, and I know them well. He has slept in my home. I've slept in home. We've been friends. We've tried cases. We've been buddies for a long time. If he would carry the principles which regulate his private life into his public conduct, he would make the best chief magistrate we have ever had. Can you believe that? I mean, better than Washington or Lincoln or Jefferson or Madison? The greatest president? Yeah, Garfield could be if he would go by. Oh, but he's not done. You could tell he's not done. He's not going to sign off there and say to the Philadelphia Times, yeah, print that. He's got a little bit more to say. I do not know any really good man who has done and assisted in doing so many bad things in politics as General Garfield. Well, Garfield gets elected. He beats Hancock. And now he writes to Black on July 20. And he says, I know how grounded you are in the ways of political thinking, which seem to you just and for the highest good of your country. And so all the more for that reason, I prize your words of personal kindness succeeding or feel, failing as president. I shall nonetheless honor your noble character and your great intellect and your equally great heart. So the friendship is sort of coming back together. Garfield gives the address, the inaugural address. That's on March 4. But on July 2nd, after being president only four years, he is shot twice in the train station as he's leaving to go see, go on vacation, meet his wife in New Jersey, go up see his boys at Williams College. He's 
walking in hand in hand with his Secretary of State, James Blaine. The man who shoots him is a disgruntled office seeker. He's, uh, he's not mentally all there. He's a, he's a um, French Canadian who you know, would never have been appointed to an American position. He wanted to be ambassador to France. He's not living in the real world. But he shoots Garfield twice. And uh, they rush Garfield back to the White House. And uh, the word gets out to Black that his friend has been shot. Here's Gar one of the pictures of Garfield as president. If there had ever been a movie on Garfield, I look at this picture and think years ago, Paul Newman could have played this role. This is a Paul Newman side view. He could have played Garfield. So I go back to, he's shot, he comes in. Black comes over, they won't let him see Garfield. He's one of the first ones there. A week goes by. And a week later, Garfield comes out of his stupor. And we know this because Alman Rockwell tells this story. And we know it because Dr. Edson is standing there. She's the only woman doctor that's attending him. And Susan tells the story. And they tell it to Mary Black. And that's why, and this is right out of our Seaver College Library, this book was published in 1887, Reminiscences of Judge Black, by his daughter, Mary. And um, Garfield raises up in great pain and says, has there been any word? Has there been any word from Judge Black? And Alman Rockwell said, oh yes, Mr. President, he was the first one here. He wanted to see you. We didn't let him in. He's been back several times. He wrote a telegraph, a telegram. It's the most sympathetic we've received. And they said, Rockwell and Susan Ed Edson, the, the doctor there, they said that Garfield slumped back into his pillow and said, that almost pays for this. Translation, it's almost worth getting assassinated if I'm back in fellowship with my brother in Christ. It's sad that it took this people killing each other, but that almost pays for this. So Garfield's term ends in 1881. They rushed him to the seaside thinking he might get better if he could look out at the ocean, New Jersey. And I drove a long time trying to find this marker. I thought, well, maybe there's not one there, but here it is behind the house. James Garfield died on this site, September 19, 1881. He lingered 11 weeks. This man who was six feet tall, weighed 210 pounds, had an enormous voice, broad-shouldered, was, you know, had cut down forests in his teenage years. He died at 130 pounds, bony, skinny. Um, the White House was draped in black. I don't think they did that for Lincoln's assassination. I've never seen, a, I, this is a stunning photo that I just, I was just surfing the net and found this photo. The White House in mourning. The sermon was preached by Frederick Power, the minister of the Vermont Avenue Church. Jeremiah Sullivan Black was in the audience. I think he probably wept, but I can't prove that. The other big funeral was at Cleveland Lakeview Cemetery. They built this for Garfield. He was the last president born in a log cabin, and they buried him in a, what is this, a temple. And the funeral was preached by Isaac Herrett, the editor of the Christian Standard which we have every issue in our archives. Um, our Eret said, I always thought he would preach my funeral. We made an agreement years ago that whoever died first, the other would preach his funeral. And I just knew I would die first. And Garfield, the President of the United States, would come preach my funeral. How many showed up at Cleveland? The actual count was a little over 250,000 people. It was the largest funeral in American history. Over a quarter of a million people came to say goodbye to Garfield at Lakeview Cemetery the lar largest funeral at that time. And what happened to the little shack, the Vermont Avenue? So much money came in from all over the country who wanted to build a nicer <laughs> church building for Garfield's old church. And they built this one, 
So the old Campbellite shanty. By the way, look at those four windows in the Campbellite shanty. Go down to the second one from the end there on the right side. That's where Garfield always sat, and that's where Guteau was going to assassinate him. He stood outside that window one Sunday, and he measured where Garfield was sitting, and he didn't want to hit Garfield's wife, and he didn't, especially he didn't want to hit Garfield's mother. But he thought he could pull it off. And he came back the next Sunday, and that was the only Sunday in the four months that Garfield wasn't at Vermont Avenue Church. He was giving a speech in Baltimore, and he was worshiping with the Christian church in Baltimore. So Garfield was not sh shot in the church building, uh, which would be horrifying enough. And then they build this gorgeous building. And then uh, Black only survives two more years, and he's buried there in York, so here's where the canvas of our story has been. On the far right, York, Pennsylvania, the home of black. On the far left, not on the far left, but below Pittsburgh, Bethany, where Campbell lived. And then up in Cleveland, up in the Cleveland area where Campbell was born in, a, I mean Garfield was born in a log cabin and went to Hiram College. Here's the speeches of Jeremiah Black. Here's the book, that was by his son. Here's the book his daughter put out. Chauncey Black said in the front of the book, I think it's unnecessary to inform the reader of these pages that Jeremiah Black was a devout Christian. And then the members of the church decided to build a college and name it for Garfield in Wichita, Kansas. It lasted four school years. And then they had a famine. All the farmers went broke. The building sat empty and was purchased by uh, the Quakers and named Fringe University, and it's still there today. It's in beautiful shape. You go up to the front. It says this building's on the National Register of Historic Places. It was once Garfield University, and today it's Fringe University. Norwood writes in his book, and I close with this, why these two men had remained such warm friends is, in some ways, an enigma. It's not happening today with the two sides. People who've been friends all their lives are not speaking to each other now. It's, you know, it's, but, but that's democracy. It's messy. It was messy when Ed Larson wrote that book on the very first campaign. And I'll tell you it was messy in 1866 when Jeremiah Sullivan Black was the lawyer for Tilden and Garfield was on the electoral commission that ended up giving all those votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. And so Briggins writes, they differed so violently in politics that it seems a sheer miracle that their friendship should have outlasted a single election. But it lived on. It lasted 20 years. And how did it end when Garfield lay dying and he heard that Jerry Black had been the first one at the White House and had come to see him and wrote the most sympathetic telegram Garfield sinks into what is really his deathbed and says, that almost pays for this. We have about five minutes, but you've been a great audience. I don't think I want to do Q&A. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed. <laughs>